From deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fish and Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas Outdoor Nation. I'm your humble host, Dustin Vaughn Warnke, and man, am I fired up about being back in front of this microphone and delivering you this content today, man. I'm so excited to get fired up with every show that I get to deliver to you and bring to uh, to your uh to your listening ears and uh you know try to provide hope inspiration the outdoor lifestyle education motivation all those other fun things with what we do here on this podcast so this week's show is going to be a little bit shorter chester was not feeling very well when i recorded this with him he had he was getting over a cold or allergies or something like that so we did kind of a shorter show and um I just I'm really excited about this one because this is a continuation of our saltwater series that we've been talking about this year here in 2018 and now that we're in the month of March and almost done with the month of March actually which is crazy um, it's just really cool to, to opportunity to sit and talk about fishing in the outdoors we talked hunting the last couple episodes public land hunting and um, and uh, hunting the world with uh, Jason Sacco and the guys from the Cast Blast Grill Chill podcast. And man, uh, it is just really cool to be back with another Saltwater Series installment. And uh, I've got a gear review in the hunting realm coming next time, so to be sure to tune in for the next show. I plan to do that. And we also have some new sponsors that I'm going to be showcasing on the show that I just sold ads to this past uh, this past week. So I'm really, really super excited about that uh, to be able to bring you some more live read ads of, of things that are really, really cool and very beneficial to you. And switching gears to this week's podcast, Chester Moore is an author, outdoor writer, videographer, speaker, blogger, podcaster, much like I am but he's been doing it for a lot longer than I have over 25 years and um, in the business and the outdoor industry as a writer and he's offered he's authored several books in the outdoor industry uh, flounder fever being one of them we're going to talk about flounder fishing on the Texas Gulf Coast today and uh, upper coast middle coast lower coast that that kind of uh, comparison of the different waters and uh places you'll find flounder and i really think you're going to enjoy this podcast but chester is one of my mentors i guess you could say in the outdoor realm uh he's kind of befriended me over the years i first met him in texas fishing game in 2013 when i attended shot show with the mag and prowler tv show and it all just kind of blossomed from there and it kind of uh, turned into you know where i'm working for the magazine full time and it's a dream come true for me able to do this show and uh so much more in the writing and, and, and the different realms that i work in here in the magazine um, I'm really excited to have him on the show because he brings a lot of insight and expertise to flounder fishing uh, as he's one of the foremost experts on this subject and I really wanted to have him on but like I say he was not feeling terrific today when I recorded this show and so it's going to be a little short but I think you'll really enjoy the content so here's my interview with Mr. Chester Moore Jr. Joining us on the phone Mr. Chester Moore Jr. from Texas Fish and Game our editor-in-chief it's good to have you back on again Chester how are you? It's always good to be on the podcast, and um, you know, you invited me to come on and talk saltwater, and for a fair amount of our readership, that's kind of what I was known for in the beginning, Yes, was saltwater fishing, particularly the ultimate inshore saltwater species, Paralethesis lethiostigma, the southern flounder. The southern flounder, okay, cool, good deal. Um, and then you've written a book about this called Flounder Fever. Is that correct? Is that what it's called? Yeah, we had Flounder Fundamentals come out in 2001. And then in uh, six we did Flounder Fever, which was the response to that with some added stuff. And honestly, I could crank out another one right now. I've learned so much more since then. But yeah, Flounder Fever is available at fishgame.com and a lot of your academy and sports and outdoors locations. I was just thinking that exactly um, because that is that is basically a book that kind of covers strategy and that's what I want to talk about in this show is strategy and things that you can do you know to make the outdoors accessible as I try to talk about in every podcast and um, and really you know have fun doing this because flounder is a great tasting fish as everybody knows and they're fairly you know they're, they're a challenge to catch sometimes and they're not why don't you tell us something about that Chester? Well, flounder is a very dynamic fish. I yes. mean, I would say the bulk of the anglers on the Texas coast that know anything about flounder know that there's a fall run, quote unquote run, um, and that is when they're migrating out into the Gulf of Mexico. They do that in November, into December for breeding purposes. They 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 spawn out in the Gulf, 
And people got to realize that there's going to be a run the next year. That means there has to be a spring run for them to come back. I see. So we are in the midst of flounder returning to the bays at the time this podcast hits. Right. And um, the spring flounder fishing is very much underrated. And there's a few things that anglers can really do to help score on fish, I think, that will um, that will help them uh, enjoy flounder fishing time beyond November. No, that's great. And I, I really try to make things, you know, accessible and easy to do and just, just practical is what I try to do since we call our Tuesday newsletter the tactical and practical newsletter. I've kind of taken that word as a as a keyword. But if you're just starting out, are you fishing with um, you know, artificials? What kind of setup are you using? Live bait, that kind of stuff. Well, um, probably most flounder on the Texas coast are caught on what's called a Carolina rig, also called a fish finder rig. Sure which is an egg weight um, and uh, in a swivel and uh, out to a leader, and then you'll have a live mud minnow or a live finger mud on it. That's probably how most flounder are caught. Okay. However, a growing number of anglers, I would like to think, thanks to me, in my writing hundreds of articles about it over the years, <laughs> my buddy Kevin Skip James who inspired me, um, catch them on artificial lures. I have caught just literally probably close to 10,000 flounder on artificial lures over the years. Goodness. And um, they are every bit as effective depending on, you know, if you learn proper presentation and stuff like that. So the basic setup that I would recommend if someone wants to try lure fishing for flounder is to take a curl tail grub. I like the twister tail from Mr. Twister, uh, a four inch or a three inch. Uh, I like the color pink. I also like the color glow or luminescent. Right. And we put that on a quarter ounce jig head. We put a little tiny piece of table shrimp on the hook for added taste. Mm -hmm. And we throw along the banks or a particular place, like a cut going into a bayou. And we roll it across the bottom and wait for a thump. When we hear the thump, we feel the thump. We wait a few seconds, set the hook, and hopefully there's a big flounder on the other side. That's cool. My father-in-law talked about this uh, in detail when he was over here this past weekend for a St. Patrick's Day party that we had, and I was telling him what our next show was going to be about, and he said, you know, he had impressed all of his friends because he was uh, he knew to wait before he set the hook because to make sure that the bait got all the way in the flounder's mouth, you know, don't set the hook immediately on the bite. Is that correct? Yeah, and so it's an old rule. I mean, I've, I've had people go extreme on it, but um, <laughs> with live bait, the general rule is you wait 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds. Goodness. Okay. Yeah, sir. I had a guy tell me what I do is I wait and I get a thunk and then I smoke a cigarette. When I'm done with the cigarette, <laughs> I set the hook. <laughs> That's some redneck ingenuity right there. <laughs> that redneck is a good thing. But um, uh, ten seconds, and I, we have video. I, you know, I worked a lot with different labs and sure. scientists and things over the years, learning about the species. And a buddy of mine from the University of Texas Marine Science Institute about a decade ago said, "You're right about the wait time." And he sent me a video of a flounder that was eating the fish that were feeding him in the facility. And for a live fin fish, it would take about. 10 seconds for that flounder to hit it and turn it where it goes down its throat. Oh, I see. It's got to turn it At because first. of the way that it's built. Okay, cool. I understand And then that. the shrimp, when they would throw a shrimp in there, the shrimp doesn't have the same spinal system. So the shrimp folds up, so that curl tail grubs like a shrimp. So right. I wait about two to three seconds to set the hook with those guys. Okay, so you're fishing artificial like the curl tail, and yet you, uh, you wait less time than you do with the live bait. Okay. Yeah, 10 seconds on live bait, three seconds on artificial. There are differences. However, uh -huh. if I feel a classic hard thump that's the two to three second wait okay if i feel just a little tick on my line but the line stops i'll wait 10 seconds then i see okay okay that makes that's a good strategy right there i like that yep, yep, yep. it's worked you know oh, it, it's caught a lot of fish that way you know no, that's good and are you typically in a boat are you typically on shore where do you catch these typically well if i catch a flounder now unless i'm in a buddy's boat it's always on bank now but right. uh, i've done most of my flounder fishing from boats and I would like to look for bayous, uh, you know, where you have a, a bayou leading into a coastal marsh. Those areas um, have a lot of bait fish. That's where flounder are going and feeding along. Sure. If, you're, if you're a bank fisherman, fish around the passes leading into the bays, fish around docks and piers. Uh -huh. um, those areas have lots of fish on them. And really one of the keys is to realize that flounder um, do like to be around structure and with their own cover and stuff like that. So. Uh, one of the problems with getting the flounder, if you get bit, a lot of people miss them at the boat or at the bank because they don't have the hook set right. right. Flounder have an extremely, extremely bony mouth like a, like a tarpon almost. Okay. So 
you need to have braided line on most of your fishing because when you have a braided line, I use a medium heavy spinning rod, and you set the hook with a no stretch line and very little stretch rod, the hook goes into the bone and that fish is caught. However, if it doesn't and the fish doesn't swallow it, it's going to spit the hook out and you're going to miss the fish. Right. Right, and all of us know what that hook spit is like. It's kind of a crush to, to your victory. <laughs> of I'll put it this way, true story. Since I've been using the braided setup, uh-huh. using that setup, I can't recall one flounder after I hooked and set the hook that I missed. Oh, wow. And so the braid is so it doesn't stretch the mono or whatever else you'd be fishing Yeah, it goes for, right probably. into the bone. Okay, it goes yeah. right into the bone straight instead of yeah. having any flex in it. Like, uh, I hate to use the word flex, but stretch in it like mono or, or fluorocarbon yeah. or anything else would. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, that's solid. And so you use, what color braid do you use or does it matter? I use, because I fish on the upper coast, so I use smoke colored Berkeley Fireline. Okay. And I actually have some of that, don't, I think. I, I just don't don't buy any of the green, like the bright green, yellow crap. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, because here's the deal. For, that's great for other fisheries, but for flounder, flounder are very sensitive to lines. As a matter of fact, we'll talk in a minute how, so sensitive sometimes you have to bust out some fluorocarbon um, in certain conditions so if you have a typical from sabine down to matagorda murky stain base system that smoke color is perfect okay and then south of there i mean you're you're you're... well it still works but um if you don't have clear water excuse me you're gonna have really clear water in, in my eyes, we're not in florida so clear water to me is like if you can see like a foot foot and a half right okay I would use a fluorocarbon leader mm-hmm. because flounder can see the line. Now, when it's real clear up here and we have high barometric pressure, which is what we have today, I can see it's really high pressure today out here. Right. Um, I use fluorocarbon and I use a lighter, I use a medium rod with fluorocarbon, about 10 to 12 pound fluorocarbon. Okay. And the reason is the flounder will see the new line without any question in clear water. The flounder can see the line. I, okay. I, I, I have. When my dad was still alive, he would be fishing one spot. He'd have braid and I'd have fluorocarbon. I would wipe the floor with it when the water cleared up. It didn't take him about two trips to figure that deal out. He was stubborn. You know? <laughs> he was wondering why he was, you were catching them all and he wasn't. Huh? <laughs> yeah, and it's only because I knew the visibility part of it. He he, he, you know, he, he just didn't want to change. He didn't want to, the, he didn't want, he didn't want to walk the truck even brought. No. You know? <laughs> After a couple of trips being decimated. Right. Uh, you know, that changed. <laughs> oh, boy, that's funny. So all of a sudden he caught on to what was going on. Huh? Real fast. I went back next time. He had all these fluorocarbon leaders and fluorocarbon lines, and my dad was a great flounder fisherman. And I uh, figured it out real quick. He just, he just changed slower than I did, you know? So the clearer the water, the need for fluorocarbon exists, correct? Is that what you're saying? Yep, yep, okay. yep. You can just make a leader out of it, or you can just do, um, oh, uh, yeah. like I did when it was real clear, I just have a fluorocarbon line and, on the high pressure days, because in, in on those high pressure days, I would also go to a two inch grub. Okay. And um and 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 right now, a great another lure to use. You can get a hold of them or a sassy shad from Mister Twister. Yes. Or any of a two inch shad imitation, little swim bait shad, the one that looks like an actual shad and has the metal flake in it. Uh huh. Because right now, what they're feeding on is the shad, a little tiny shad in the ecosystem. Is kind of what they're mainly feeding on. Okay. So even something like a Z-Man, um, you know, shad or, you know, some kind of soft plastic shad that you can mount on a jig head of some kind or a, or, a, or a grip pin hook like that would work, right? Yeah, and once again, a little tiny piece of shrimp for teeth to go a long way in helping that flounder hold on. Okay, because you wanted to grab and hold on. You wanted to taste a little something when... Yeah, and, and gulp can be great, too. Gulp, um, okay. For gulp, the only gulp I like to use is the gulp swimming mullet in smoke color. Okay. That's good to know. The the, the curl tail grub and the uh, swim baits, the shad swim baits, are the only small plastics I ever use for flying Okay, anymore. cool. And this is this is basically, you know, you're you're allowed to take flounder of other means, but fishing for them, I would say, in your estimation, is probably the most fun, right? Oh, that, I, don't, I don't I don't gig. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't gig. I catch and you don't bow fish for them either, because you can. I think you can do that. No, too. no, 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 no. You got. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Would you go to Lake Fork and shoot a bass with a bow? No, of course not. No, well, number there one, it's illegal. Go. But right. number two, it's it's. it's but uh, yeah. I, prefer to, I prefer the thump 
than right. the aerial piercing. Because there's that challenge, and that's why we do the outdoors, as I talked about on the previous podcast with the Cast Blast Grill Chill podcast. You know, it's it's about that challenge. It's about that unknown in the outdoors that you may or may not hook into that fish if you do something right or hold your mouth the right way or whatever. You know, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of that way. And flounder are great because they're, they're, they are a good fish. But I want to talk about the conservation purposes. Yes. I was very involved my whole career and trying to get the flounder recognized as a sport fish and regulation came have changed 10 years ago. I had the incredible honor of being, and, I, and me and my dad caught a lot of the brood stock for flounder in our Texas release. I had the incredible honor of being able to release the first ever flounder released in Texas. Wow, no, that's great. That was my number one coastal fisheries honor. I'll never forget that. My daughter Faith was there. My dad was there. A very special moment. Our Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. The, the staff at Sea Center, Texas, the hardworking biologists at places like University of Texas Marine Science Institute okay. have done an incredible job with flounder, and there's a hope for that species now. That's great. I mean, so there's a... That's a big flounder. Here's right. the deal. I, I, you know, there, there, there's guys that I call trout snobs, right? <laughs> and, yeah, we know what you And, and there's these guys that will, like, literally ban you from their life, try to ruin your whole life and career if you keep a big trout. <laughs> because you got to conserve the big trout. Right. I have met some of these people that threw big flounder in an ice chest. Mm -hmm. The difference is trout numbers are historically been way up, and the flounder numbers were way down for a long time. Right. So my challenge is, is if a flounder is better than 20 inches, put it back in the bay so that spawns. That'll be a big female. Sure. Let it spawn. Let it go back and keep the others to eat. Kind of like you would with a, with a big bass in freshwater, right? It's the same. It's the same exact process. Okay. I had a thing called Flounder Revolution did for five years. We gave out from uh, March through uh, from March through November. We gave out replicas of uh, fish through the Fish Mount store in Florida uh, for the biggest catches. We had uh, nearly one thousand flounder, twenty inches of better back in the water. Whoa, that's amazing! And we did that from two thousand and eight to two thousand and thirteen. And uh, it was my way of kickstart. It was my version of chair lunker for flounder, right? Okay, sure. Um, and it was really cool, and it was just trying to get people thinking about releasing those bigger flounder. Right, you know? right. Not just eating everything they catch, yeah. And uh, kill the small ones if you want to. I mean, whatever legal. I, I eat flounder too, you know, but sure. I, I think it's very important to be good stewards of the resources and um, the guy gave us to make sure and put those bigger fish back. No, I agree. And every time I have you on, I like to always talk about conservation because that's one of the things you and I are both, is both kind of close to our heart and you've done, you know, so much work in the outdoors for conservation. You know, um, what other fish might you catch when you are flounder fishing? Um, like hardheads and that kind of stuff. I mean, do you have any warnings or any? Well, you're going to catch, you know, you can't escape hardheads and gas pops <laughs> you know, everywhere. <laughs> Um, but redfish are probably the most common fish to catch. Okay. Flounder fishing. Okay. Yep. And do they, and that's um, always a nice bonus. If it's a legal size red, that's a nice bonus, you know? Yeah, that's true. That is a nice bonus. Yeah. That's an extra added value, I guess, to be out there on the flounder trail is catching a, a nice red. Um, and then, you know, hard heads, obviously I want to say this with every time we mention them, be very careful of those fins. Uh, they can sting you and, and they're not fun to, uh, to have an injury from, right? Yeah, I've had one buried into my calf before, oh. uh, swinging one into the boat. So be very careful. That's got toxin on it. And if they have the flesh-eating bacteria attached to that, you're really in trouble. Right. So be very careful handling, handling, handling those things. Okay. No, that's good. And uh, as far as gaff top, do you eat them? I'm just curious. I don't because the whole upper Texas coast has a uh, warning for eating gaff top because of toxins. Okay, I wouldn't order that. But I, I had eaten it before. And they do taste good if you're in an area there's no warning. But I will say this. My neighbor liked to eat them. And I went outside one day, and he was pressure washing them. <laughs> Not with like a hose, like an actual pressure washer yeah. to wash the house with. He goes, once you pressure wash the slime off of them, they're good to eat. So, <laughs> true story. They're so, so slimy. If you pressure wash the fish, you might want to let him go. Well, I just, I, I think that's good. Good. They, they have the slime on there, obviously, for protection. But the saltwater experience that I have, every hardhead or flounder that we are, uh, hardhead or, or gaff top, I should say, that we that we caught, the thing, you know, just slime the whole line, you know, with its slime. Well, they know. do. It's, it, look, it's I actually thought of a tournament we could do called the Gulf Coast Slime Masters. I wrote about this <laughs> next fishing game years ago. And the whole goal of it is you go out with a jar. All the jars are the same. 
And at the end of the day, you weigh in the amount of gaff top slime <laughs> you get off of it. And whoever has the most slime wins. <laughs> the slime, what did you call it? The slime slam? Or the what? Gulf Coast Slime Masters. Slime Masters. Oh, that's great, Chester. That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Well, I was, you know, I went to Louisiana a couple of times this summer and this past fall, and the, the Louisiana folks that were cleaning our fish, and I cleaned some of them, too, because I just love to clean fish, as weird as that sounds, um, they they were saying, well, we don't eat gaff top, we don't take them on board, and I was like, man, I grew up eating this fish, you know, and I, it finally dawned on me that they, they have such a rich population of specks and reds, they don't need to eat them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's like, gaff top actually got tasty meat, but if you got red fish, throw them stuff back. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> It doesn't matter how big they are, but yeah, it's just about being safe and being careful around that stuff. That's why I want to have you on is just talk about that. And the conservation effort, I think every, you know, not throwing those hard heads up on land where people can possibly step on them. That's another good idea. Um, well, you know, they need to go back out in the water and they can do what hard heads do. Right. And, and just don't throw them up on the bank of the beach. That yeah, kind of stuff. I'm just saying most be, people get hit by them walking on them. Right. Be, be respectful of that and be respectful of your neighbor. You know, if you catch them, I'll never forget in the freshwater world where one time I was bow fishing on Lake, um, Calaveras in San Antonio for uh, tilapia and the guys that would cast net for them would go out there and they'd muddy all the water. It's not good for bow fishermen, but you know, wind and cast netters are your two biggest thing when bow fishing for tilapia. But, uh, the funny thing is we, you know, it's saying, do not throw the, um, placoscomus, you know, the uh, algae eaters up on, on the bank because they multiplied like rabbits. And there was just mounds and mounds and mounds of those armored catfish, those placoscomus on the bank that people threw out. <laughs> and you couldn't walk anywhere on the bank because there were just mounds of them, you know. And I'm like, somebody missed the message on conservation there. You, you kill them, you know, take them back with you or throw them in the trash or whatever. But, you know, don't throw them up on the bank. Definitely not. That's just my thought, so... Anyway, but uh, anything else to add there, Chester? I know you aren't. No, nah, it's the just best a great way. time, and the flounder are coming back in. A lot of most of them are probably back in the bays now, but it's a great time. You know, one final tip I'll give you in terms of this conversation, then we can come back on maybe do another one later in the summer. Sure. Is water clarity means a lot. Okay. So if you have an area where the water's a little clear, if you have really muddy water, not good. If you have kind of tea stained water. Yeah. good yep so look for a little bit of change a little bit of change in clarity and we see those shorelines where it looks like it's raindrops because little tiny baby shad mm -hmm. there's flounder amongst them flip that little soft plastic shad in there wait for the thump wow that's great that's great news i mean that's and that's an ample that's an ample day of catching flounder if you get into them like that right absolutely yeah that's great so better places for on the coast texas gulf coast because texas gulf coast is of course you know miles and miles long um is it better upper i mean i know you have more experience with the upper but what about lower coast and mid coast? yeah there's good fun of fishing can, can be found anywhere upper coast is better because there's a lot less gigging okay the giggers hammer them down and the commercial giggers hammer them matagore to south and there's uh, there's better chances for rotten real fish on the upper coast. On the upper coast, okay, that's good to know. So yeah. I know not everybody that there's listens. There's good flounder fishing everywhere okay. in pockets, but if I were if I were to plan a flounder trip, I would do Sabine Lake without any question. Sure. Uh, or skip across the border and go to Lake Calcasieu, and um, yep. and, and then Galveston Bay. There's a lot of great spots in Galveston. We've got a guy that advertises with us in the magazine from Lake Calcasieu, and then um. The, then we also have, you know, guys that contribute that, that can take you on a trip like this if you don't have your own boat like Chester and I don't, you know. So, um, you know, but it, you can even do this from the shore. I mean, that's the thing. I always try to make this accessible for everybody. So, yeah, great opportunities around piers, shorelines, all that kind of stuff. Don't limit yourself. Uh, look at each opportunity as a challenge. Appreciate the chance to be out there yeah. and um, wait for the thump. When you feel the thump, wait, wait a couple of seconds, <laughs> set the hook and get ready to catch a big flounder. <laughs> I love having you on the show. Thanks very much for joining us, Chester. It's always an honor. And there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chester Moore, the wildlife journalist, uh, Texas Fish and Games editor-in-chief. Incredible guy. I love this guy so much. Um, he's just an awesome dude. He's also the head of Kingdom Zoo Wildlife Center, and uh, and their their motto over there is called to conserve. So he's really big about conservation, which is why I love to have him on the show. And also he has a podcast. Uh, he just recently did a show on Jack Hanna and a chance for your kid to become a world wildlife journalist. 
and uh, he's really really cool uh, podcast going on called the Wildlife Journalist, and uh, it's a short short you know a lot shorter than these podcasts. Uh, they come out every week, I believe, and you can definitely check that out at thewildlifejournalist.com. That's thewildlifejournalist.com. I'll put that in the show notes as well, so you can check that out. Subscribe to his blog and uh, check out what he's up to with uh, with his kids and um, and all the kids that he inspires in the great outdoors. Our next generation of great outdoorsmen. So. If you've not done so already, please subscribe to the newsletter, Tactical Practical Tuesday, Wildlife Wednesday, and the Thursday Texas State of the Outdoor Nation. Please subscribe to the magazine if you've not done so yet. Subscriptions are relatively cheap. You get a digital subscription along with a print subscription, and you really have a good way to consume a lot of great content through the Texas Fishing Game app that you can download free on the iOS uh, iTunes Apple Store, or you can go on your Android to the Google Play Store and download it from there. And uh, however you're listening, thank you so much for doing so. Please also subscribe to our show. Give us a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Um, it does not cost you a thing to listen to this show. If you could just give us a five-star rating in iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you heard this show, uh, FM Player, wherever you heard the podcast, if you just give us a positive rating, that would help other people find our show. And uh, we've already got a great audience, but it would be great to have even more people tuning into this stuff. And that just really um, makes me feel great. <laughs> Uh, that I can I can show up every two weeks and do this show and uh, you guys are really without you the listener we wouldn't have a show I say that often but uh, I really mean it I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for for tuning in and listening it means the world to me and to be able to do this show I just ordered in some new headphones for my po- mobile mobile mic that I've got for uh, going around and doing uh, mobile podcasts I'm going to continue to do some of those especially for guys that have a lot of busy schedules that I need to travel to go see them to get a show recorded so I've got that mobile Yeti Blue mic that I used in uh, at Shot Show this year, and then I'm also uh, got two headphones, uh, two sets of headphones for that, so I can plug that into my laptop and grip it and rip it, baby. Uh, thanks again so much for watching, reading, and listening. Have an awesome day in the outdoors. We'll see you next time.